everyone. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this special assembly, and I really expect your attention and your respect. And if you're not able to comply with that, I'm going to ask you to come in. Um, this is a really special opportunity, and we don't want you to bring everybody. I know it's just like a couple of you, and so many of you are excited to be here right now. We have this opportunity to hear from an award-winning author who has inspired countless readers, including a lot of you, with her captivating stories and powerful messages of hope and resilience. A special thank you to Vermont Humanities and the Keller Covered Library. Thank you, Jacob and Dan, for making this event possible for the students here at 32. I'm going to introduce you to Amber McBride. Her 2021 debut novel and verse, Me Ma, was a National Book Award finalist. She was awarded the prestigious Coretta Scott King John Steptoe New Talent Award in 2022, in addition to many, many other accolades. Since then, she has published three more books, in addition, in addition to editing an anthology of poetry with a new novel coming out next week. And in her spare time, she enjoys pretending it's Halloween every day, organizing her crystals, watching K-dramas, and accidentally scrolling through TikTok for three hours at a time. She believes in ghosts, and what we just found out in her writing workshop, she believes in mermaids, and she believes in me. I'm so delighted that she's here. We are so very fortunate. I'm honored to lean in and listen alongside all of you. Let's give a warm U32 welcome to Amber McBride. poetry. 
that's a little bit different than fiction is that it's so more, like there's so fewer words involved in it, right? So if you read a poem, a novel in verse can be like 10, 20,000 words. If you read a novel, it's like 50,000 words. Um, and the cool thing about poetry is like the brevity of it, right? So you get so much from so little. Um, do any of you have any favorite poets? Yeah. Right here. Yes, right here. Shakespeare. Shakespeare. We've got no one liking Shakespeare. I love it. Anybody a Kendrick Lamar fan? Yeah. I thought you said the other day. I asked for your favorite poet. All right. Some Eminem fans. All right. Virginia, uh, and then I went to grad school in Boston, uh, and then I started being a uh, professor when I was 25 years old, and I recently resigned from the University of Virginia as a professor, where I taught for about eight years. Um, but my introduction into English and poetry was very different. I originally was pre-med when I went to college. I was going to be a doctor. Um, imagine my parents' disappointment when I told them I was switching to English from pre med um, But anywho, I had a, got in a car accident and I decided that I really liked reading and I wanted to change my major to English. So then I went to uh, my teacher, I changed to English, I graduated, I went to grad school. And one thing that I kept getting told by teachers in my grad school program is that I wasn't writing poetry the way I was supposed to be writing it. Do you ever get that? People telling you you're not writing how you're supposed to be doing it? And I didn't quite understand I love that, that what they meant by that, right? One part was like, I didn't like to write form. I didn't want to rhyme. I didn't want to write like Shakespeare. The other thing is like, I didn't want to write about what everyone else was writing about. I was a black student, one of the only ones in my entire program um, at Emerson College. And the things I wanted to write about, nobody seemed to care about. I was told that my poetry was simplistic. I was often told that it was too complicated. And I was often told by professors that I would never become published. Um, you know when you get to like flex something? Now I'm on the Emerson website as one of their most accomplished graduates. Um, but they've asked me to come speak there three times and I said no. Because I was like, yes, right? Respect yourself. Um, but, so what's a period? I love it. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, is that we're so often told what we cannot do. That we're working within this system that has decided that we should write a certain way, think a certain way. But your individual voice is very important. And the way that you decide to write, and the way that you decide to show up creatively, or in things that you like, whether it's sports, whether it's music, whether it's acting, um, it doesn't matter. It, really important to be true to what you believe in. And so by doing that, I decided to get my MFA in it and also decided to keep teaching um, and writing the way that I wanted to. And in my classrooms at first Northern Virginia Community College and then the University of Virginia, that's the biggest thing I wanted to teach my students. I wanted them to understand that their voice and the way that they wrote was important. It didn't really matter if it was completely what I decided it should be when it came creatively to writing. If they knew why they decided to do something, that was important. Um, so that was great until I got to UVA, and because I was one of the only black professors at UVA, I don't know why, but suddenly all the football players ended up in my class, and uh, none of them liked writing poetry, of course. 
Um, so we decided to have a poetry slam instead. So I got these football players who are like six foot tall, much bigger than me. We hosted this little poetry slam and everybody showed up. And for the first time, these guys who usually only play football were talking about things that they thought were really, really difficult um, that they were dealing with um, at UVA. So all that to say is that writing can be a way to express yourself. It doesn't necessarily have to be or critical writing, it can be poetry, it can be rap music, it can be anything that you find that you're passionate about. Um, let's see, did I miss anything? Oh, I was younger than that when I started teaching college. You ever remember a fact about yourself you put up here? When I was, I've been a professor for a decade now, and that makes me feel very, very old. All right, let's see. Um, so we're talking a little bit about what makes you poem. So let's talk about poetry with you a bit. So, what do, does anybody have an idea of when they think of poetry, what they think makes a good poem? And don't yell out, I will pick someone who hasn't spoken. Yes, right here. Rhymes. Rhymes. Okay, rhyming. I call someone in the corner. Go ahead. Someone over here raise their hand. No? Yes. Oh, things that should change. Is that what you said? Like what good stuff. Like good stuff, yeah. Changing things that are bad into good things. So writing about activism, perhaps. Anything else? Yes. Emotion. Right. So like, when you're listening to a song, what's the difference between when you're listening to a song, and you're like, eh, this is a good song, and a song, and then you get like chills? Like, what is the difference there for y'all? All the way, yes, right here. Uh, poetic form. Like, poetic form? Format. Oh, the format of the poem. So if it's in a form, a sonnet, a palindrome. I can kind of see people in the back. Who's in the back on the stairs? Yes, you. Go ahead. Oh, um, like if it's kind of like, you know, like it has sticks to a consistent form. A consistent form. Yeah, like. So we're talking a little bit about that. And beside you, what were you going to say? Something that makes you feel something deeply. Ooh, yes. I like that one. So the aspect of that is something that makes you feel something deeper is what I kind of want to go on a little bit. So we're talking about how poetry is different because it's really going at your emotions and how it makes you feel and the things that are important to you, right? So when we talk about poems are work that kind of touch us or make us feel like we're being seen, usually you have to give something of yourself, right? So like something that feels important about yourself. So I was gonna tell you all a little bit of a, a story about me and my dog, her name's Shiloh. I had a picture here, but I don't know where it went. That dog right there is named Loki. Um, that's at my local coffee shop. Loki is the, the actual mascot of that coffee shop. Um, he's a chihuahua, but he thinks he's a Rottweiler, I think. He's got a big personality. Um, but anywho, so I have a dog, I had a dog, her name was Shiloh. So, how many people here have pets? Okay, we're, we're pet people. Everyone? I love that. Okay. All right, so when I say something like, I really love my dog, y'all kind of get what that means, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you love your pet, right? But let me tell you a story, and this is the difference what I'm saying between just poetry and telling a story. So my dog, her name was Shiloh. I got her when I was 21 years old. Um, I was in college. And my parents got me my dog Shiloh because I have severe clinical depression. So my parents thought that if I had a dog, I'd be able to kind of regulate my emotions a bit better. And so I got Shiloh and my parent, it, it's a big responsibility having a dog in college, especially a purebred German Shepherd who weighs 80 pounds, um, which was my dog. Uh, she was really nice, except for that one time that she accidentally killed a deer. Um, oh. Look at that one. It wasn't her fault, okay? So, I that's the thing that can hear attention on All right. I'll answer questions later, I promise. My dog, Shiloh, um, she was my emotional support dog. She was there for me through college, through going to grad school, through so many difficult parts of my life. And she was basically my rock. 
You know how your dog is like your person, your thing, you go when you're upset? So um, all through this time, I had thought my mental health had gotten better. But in reality, I was just using my dog. And so this became a little bit more noticeable to me about four years ago. And my therapist was like, Amber, your dog is 12 years old and a German Shepherd. We're going to have to start talking about what's going to happen when she passes. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Didn't you hear about that pill that you can give your dog? They, they were like researching it, or your dog can live forever. Um, that's what's going to happen. She's going to figure, we're going to figure this out. She's like, Amber, that's not realistic. So we start to talk about like, when you have an emotional support dog that is very supportive to you, what do you do after that? And so I, um, Ended up going through that process, and unfortunately, my dog Shiloh passed away when I when she was 13 years old, so a year later. Um, right, y'all. My students. We I had to cancel class for a week. Um, my students put money together and tried to get me another dog. It was the cutest thing ever. Um, but the point was, it was really really difficult. And the thing I realized when I, she passed away, was that everything I was feeling when I was 21 and I had all those emotions, I never actually addressed. I kind of just used her as a crutch. And I had to back up in the middle of my career after my first book had come out where all these wonderful things are happening. I'm getting all these awards and all I care about is that my dog isn't here anymore. Um, I had to go to LA, I had to go to all these places, but I didn't want to go and I didn't care. All I cared about was my dog being gone. And so when I write poetry and when I write about mental health like I do in Royal Spirit Smiling, I kind of really put a lot of myself into those books. I try to point out how and why when we add emotions into poetry, we're able to connect so much with people. Because when I say my dog died and I tell that story now, you understand how important she was to me. But I'm injecting that same energy into these poems that I write um, to try to help people deal with whatever they might be dealing with. Um, I think that living is hard sometimes. Going through every day is hard sometimes, and understanding that other people can understand and that we can relate with each other is really, really important. So the aspect of poetry that is different is what was said in the back over here, is there is so much emotion and empathy in poetry. Not just sympathy. Sympathy is saying like, oh, I guess I get what you're going through. Empathy is actually understanding and putting yourself in the position of that, what that person is going through. And I think that poetry leads to that because there's so few words, there's no place to hide in poetry. You have to be vulnerable. You have to say who you are because if you don't, people will call and say, you know what, that's not authentic. Um, and that's why when you're writing and you're thinking about your own writing, whether it's poetry or anything, okay. being authentic okay. is incredibly important. Um, so, we have time for a couple of questions. I feel like there were some questions about my dog before we kept going. Yes. Yes, go ahead. How do you accidentally kill a deer? How do you accidentally kill a deer? I'll tell you. Um, what happened was, in Virginia, I'm actually here, it's pretty rural and I, where I live, and I was hiking with my dog, and it was a weird situation where a bear kind of appeared, and a deer also appeared around the same time. And my dog was like hyper aware because she was chasing the deer and then end up, ended up like chasing the bear as well. And then accidentally like ran full force into the deer, which I don't know how she knocked it over. And then I guess instincts just set in. It's a German Shepherd. So that happened. But she technically saved me from a bear at the same time. So like, I'm taking it as a win. Um, have y'all ever seen the Great Pyrenees? Like the all white dogs? Yeah. My neighbor's dog, I live, like I said, I live in a very rural area. Her Great Pyrenees actually ended up hurting a deer as well. I don't know why, maybe it's just dogs in Virginia doing that. Um, but she was protecting me from a bear when it happened. Uh, I have one more thing to say before we go to regular questions. Um, but I did want to point out a couple of things because I'm supposed to be talking a little bit more about poetry to you, is that I just want you to remember that when we talk about poetry and when we talk about what good poetry is, that definition is constantly changing. Novels and verse, which is what I write, a lot of my novels are written through poetry, were not a thing for a long time, and now they are. Good poetry used to have to rhyme and sound like Shakespeare for it to be good, you know? 
We used to think, we had to convince a whole generation that rap music counted as poetry until Kendrick wins the um, Pulitzer. Every time I say Kendrick's name, all I can think out of is the diss track he put out this summer. Yeah. So good. And that was for the Super Bowl. That should be interesting. Um, all right, calm down. All right. But remember that. Remember that poetry has a larger definition than just being words that rhyme and that you have access to it whenever you want. Like, you're allowed to write poetry the way you want. You're allowed to think that things are poetry because you like it. Um, and I often talk to my, I guess when I taught at the UVA with the football players, one of them was telling me that like when they throw a perfect, he's a quarterback, when he throws a perfect, like, I don't play football, so don't get mad at me, that spir spiral, thank you. When he throws that, it feels like poetry. That's what he told me. And I was like, well, then it is. Right? Like, poetry can be the thing that you're good at. If you play hockey and you get a goal, when you are dancing and you hit a double turn, those are all things that incorporate the feeling of what poetry can be. So remember, like, there's a broad definition, and working within that definition gives you more access to what poetry can be. Um, it seems like there are a lot of questions, so we will have a Y'all have a lot of things you want to ask. Okay. Oh, also. You know what, I'm just gonna let you ask your question. Go ahead. Uh, how many points did you have? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about. Did it have Uh, I think it was a dub. It didn't have any players. He's so disappointed. My dog is still talented. Okay. Yes. What'd you say? No, I don't. Should I? What's it called? Yeah. <laughs> it's a no. It's a no from the front row. Yeah. All right. Y'all, if you're calming down, we can ask more questions. Yes, right here. Uh, she just died from old age. You know, the bigger the dog, usually they live longer. She was an 80 pound German Shepherd and was 13 when she passed, which is pretty old for a German Shepherd. So she just fell asleep. It was peaceful for her. Yes. Do I have a dog now? No, because I can't have another mental breakdown. Um, no, like, honestly, truly, it would be really hard to get another dog right now. Um, I love how these questions are about my dog. Yes, go ahead. Outside of like in my life when I was younger, did I just like feel like writing poetry, get like inspired? Yeah, I did. I think that I was always very inclined to writing. I had a lot of feelings, like we all do sometimes, and I always wanted to get them out. And often it was in math class because I was very bad at math in school. Um, I was the person who my teachers would joke. I got like a perfect score on the English SOL, and then like math, they were like, "What is wrong? Why can't she count?" Um, I'm better now, but yeah, it was not great right now. Uh, higher up, all the way, go ahead. Uh, what's your favorite Kendrick Lamar song? <laughs> I really like They're Not Like Us right now. Oh my God. <laughs> But well, that's also because I'm not a Drake fan, so. Yeah, we Wait, y'all. So giggly. Wait, at the top, I have a question. What's your favorite Kendrick Lamar song? Uh, I think it's like N95. I think. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. From that, that's his newest album after this, so that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not my favorite album. Sing it I don't know. All right. Ooh. I want to do a few in the back, right here. Yes. Yes.
when my dog comes. I think it's hard in the sense that like everything, you have to remember everything has a cycle, right? It's hard because you have to learn to deal and live without them. It's also good. Yeah, it's good because you have all those memories. And I get to talk about my dog all the time, which is great. She just died of But I was like, I fed my dog like real boiled chicken and rice. Like my dog was spoiled. I know she did. Okay, the other part of the question was what made me want to write poems? Um, the honest answer, I, I don't, the honest answer is that I didn't like writing essays and poems were shorter when I was younger. And then I started to realize that like, I could express myself easier, easier in poems. Sometimes you just need a few words. All right, let's go, was there someone in this general area? Yeah, you first and then yeah. uh, What's your favorite editing song? Y'all are very concerned with the music dreams. Here's the thing, I'm not, here we go. This is gonna get a reaction. I'm not an Eminem fan. Um, I have, 
I can't count. Like, it's a problem. You know addiction? Like, when you have, like, a thing like reflection? Like, I probably have over a thousand, unfortunately. Some of them are big. Some of them are tall. One of them is, like, in the shape of wings. It's an animal. What's my favorite Jason Reynolds book? Uh, Long Way Down. That's the best one, yeah? There's so many there. That's the best one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great journey.